Hi, this is Dean Frankel, and I'm joined by my colleague Cosman Laszlo. We're part of the larger energy storage team at Lux Research. It's an area that has a lot of potential for cleaner cars and renewable integration backed by innovation in batteries, supercapacitors, fuel cells. But it's also one that's getting increasingly crowded and competitive. So where's all this attention coming from, all this interest in energy storage? Well, people are jostling for you know, tens of billions of dollars in revenues. Uh, some energy storage winners are here today while others are five or more years out. And so to bring some clarity here, we'll, we'll take a look back at 2014 and also what the you know, energy storage stories of the future will be in, in 2015 and beyond. And Cosman, I know you've been following this closely, and, and in your mind, what do you think is the energy storage story of 2014? Yeah, absolutely. For me, it's got to be the Tesla Panasonic Gigafactory. Tesla, here's an EV maker that's come back from the brink of bankruptcy and has now overtaken Toyota, Nissan, General Motors, these other giant OEMs in terms of leading the world in battery usage for advanced automotive applications. And right now, isn't Tesla more focused on the you know, higher end luxury niche electric vehicle market? That's right. You know, they've made this business on the back of a $100,000 car which is out of the range of most people. However, with the Gigafactory, they have a line of sight to much lower cost batteries, which should trickle down to the final car itself, opening it up to more uh, potential buyers for this car. Now, that being said, they're also counting on some pretty high volumes. So in our view, that really mm -hmm. opens up a risk of some pretty serious overcapacity a little later down the road. And so what do you think are the immediate risks of that, of that overcapacity? So it can have some really interesting knock-on effects for other applications for energy storage. So Tesla has already dipped a toe into stationary energy storage with Solar City. So they are working together with Solar City to pair lithium-ion batteries with photovoltaics. If the batteries get even cheaper, thanks to the Gigafactory, and if there's a lot of them coming onto the market, that could do a lot for that application and other stationary energy storage applications. Great stuff for Panasonic, for Tesla, and for developers, uh, but not so much for the competitors. Now, the Gigafactory and lowering costs, you know, that's one way to go about it. But another way, which has emerged recently, and I know you've been following, is financing. Right, and this is something that did not exist a year ago. In just that short time, we've seen over $180 million go to a select few developers to finance energy storage assets in a way that emulates the solar leasing model. Great. And how does financing actually work? The project finance fund will pay the developer. In this case, you know, we could talk about STEM, which is one of the, the largest players in the space. Um, and then the STEM will install those batteries for the customer for peak demand management, and the customer will pay back the fund. The advantage for the customer is that it's no money down, and that because peak demand uh, management is an attractive application, they are able to see instantaneous savings. Their monthly savings on their electricity bill are much greater, or should be much greater, than what they have to pay the fund on a monthly basis. So that's interesting, but it also seems quite new and risky. So what's the type of company that's actually providing financing for this mm -hmm. kind of scheme? And here I think the analogy to the solar industry uh, holds true again. It started off, you know, uh, as you see the risk-reward return mature, um, it started off with, you know, private investors investing a small amount of sums. But very quickly we've seen that change as and as battery costs decline and also as the operating assets become more well understood and mature, uh, we expect that larger and larger financial institu institutions will be playing a role. We're starting to see that, you know, maybe some fund managers are starting to get in the game, but uh, we haven't seen the likes of Goldman Sachs and, and Bank of America jump in and really back these assets. But as the uh, industry matures, as the op operating risks become well understood, and uh, as this potential becomes larger, we, we do expect both the dollar amount and the uh, you know, types of players to improve. But we focused a lot on uh, stationary and uh, also primarily on lithium ion. But I know, I know you've been covering this a lot, so what, what is there to look forward to beyond lithium ion? Yeah, that's a great question. And lithium ion, we do feel that is going to be the solution for the next five years, maybe even 10 years. But there's these so-called next generation technologies that are out there on the horizon. We think there's a lot of hype and confusion associated with these, but there's a handful of developers that are doing great work. One of the ones that we're tracking is Oxus, which is a UK-based 
Lithium Sulfur Developer uh, that's really been making some solid steps over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so what are the key advantages that you see in lithium sulfur over you know, more traditional lithium ion technology? So lithium sulfur has the potential to be cheaper and also packing more energy into the same amount of weight. One of the key issues, however, has been the durability. So there, you just can't get enough cycles out of these batteries so far. Oxus has done some great work recently to get the cycle life up to 1,000 cycles, which is getting pretty close to lithium ion. They've also been able to adapt a lithium ion existing production line, which means that they have proven the manufacturability of this battery to some extent. Definitely not a home run just yet, but certainly a key company to watch in our opinion. Now, as we look out to 2015 and beyond, what's the market prognosis? You know, for vehicles. Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. So, so looking at vehicles, we see um, you know a very solid growth of around 25 percent uh, for the next year. But that's starting from a very small base. So in total, we expect U.S. car sales to be less than 1% and you know, similar trends globally, perhaps even less. Um, but that does represent a large amount of batteries and, and also provides value chain opportunities beyond Tesla and Panasonic. And there are still disruptive opportunities there. And uh, despite the you know, low overall total, that, that battery volume is, is quite large. Mm. And uh, if we consider the other side, the stationary energy store side. Mm -hmm. Um, so 2015 is going to be a banner year for stationary energy storage. We have an absolutely massive 1.3 gigawatt um, energy storage mandate that it's, it's in its first procurement year in 2015 uh, in California. Um, we also have uh, you know, the growth of distributed energy storage, which we, which we spoke about earlier. And through financing applications, um, we see you know, very uh, solid growth opportunities in a select few U.S. geographies and internationally countries like Germany, Japan, and Australia. All right, exciting stuff. Thank you, Dean. And while that certainly covers some of the bases of what the energy storage team researches at Lux, um, there's a lot more that we would love to discuss. So please feel free to reach out to us at info at luxresearchinc.com or visit our website at www.luxresearchinc.com. Thank you.